I wanted was to be so powerful that nobody could ever do anything to me again. Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 432. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Grandmaster James Keenan. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick, and I'm just a guy who really loves martial arts. So I found a whistle kick, and that's why we do this show. And on top of the show, we do a lot of other things. If you head to whistlekick.com, you'll see all the things we do, including the products that we make. And if you check out the store, you make a purchase. Use the code PODCAST15. That's going to get you 15% off everything. The whole shebang, from protective equipment to uniforms to hats, sweatshirts, tees, sweatpants, shoes. I mean, there's a, there's a lot in there. You should go check it out. We're adding stuff all the time, too. Now, if you want more information on this show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go. And that's where you'll find transcripts and links to play every single episode we've ever done, videos, and just a bunch that's going to give you context into our guests and our topics, help you understand more about what's going on, where they've come from, and maybe even reach out to some of them. As a passionate martial artist, I enjoy talking to other passionate martial artists. That's kind of the hallmark of this show. And that's what we're bringing you today. The stories of a man who's been training for a very long time, who's traveled all around the world and influenced and been influenced by some pretty amazing people. We've had a lot of great storytellers on the show over the years, and today's guest ranks up there with the absolute best. So here is my conversation with Grandmaster Keenan. Hi, Jeremy. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. And yourself? Very well. I'm very well. Good. I'm looking, you know, the, the, at, I'm looking at your picture in Zoom and your, the picture that you have up, you're sitting in a car. Yeah. And, and I'm just suddenly getting this comedians in cars getting coffee vibe. Such a good show, isn't it? <laughs> uh, we've done a couple episodes of what I, I toyed with calling uh, martial artists in cars talking about <laughs> martial arts. Uh, <laughs> couple with my brother where we were just, we were driving somewhere and I said, you know, half the time we're talking about martial arts anyway. So let me just record it. And I have a, a GoPro that uh -huh. I on a dash mount and just video us talking. And it's funny because those episodes are just so, to me, they're so simple mm -hmm. and people really enjoy them because there's, there's a different quality in the interaction. I don't know if, you, if you're, if you're a fan of, of Jerry Seinfeld's show there. Oh, I've watched all of it. Oh, uh, it, it's so fantastic. And, and I think the current season, I don't know if you saw, uh, maybe it was last season, he went through all of the knockoffs, all the shows that are using roughly the same title. Yes, yes. Which I found hysterical. Well, you know, everybody wants to copy a good idea. Yes, yes, they do. <laughs> but the nice thing about it is that there's a certain level of informality you know, yes. where it's, oh, we're just having a chat. This isn't like a, an interview. This is, we're just having a chat. And that's, that's the type of format that we, we try to do with martial arts radio. You know, when I started, geez, over four years ago, I four, wasn't in four experience. years. Yeah. That's, that's really good. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. You're going to be episode 432. 432. That's actually an excellent, excellent episode number. I like that number. Yes. Okay. Are you a, are, are, are you a numerologist? Every now and then, you know, I'll look at lucky numbers and, <laughs> and a nine is a good number for me. And so 32 and four that you add those three numbers together, yeah. you get nine. So it's bound yeah. to be good. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked for that. Then. <laughs> uh, one of the things I'm, I'm seeing, I see the photos and I'll, I'll go through those later. But one of the things that's important, I've got to know what to, what to call you. What title do you go by? Well, Jim. Okay. And if we were training? <laughs> yeah, you, you know, the, um, the titles that people use, you know, they vary depending on the formality of the circumstances. Sure. Like if you were talking about me as sort of what my position in Dotoku Shinkai is, you would refer to me as a head instructor or a grand master or, or we were on the, the mat and we were in the um, sort of Japanese cultural setting, you would just call me sensei. And if we were working on uh, Chinese arts, 
and we were in some kind of formal setting, you might refer to me as Shurfu or something like that. But 99% um, of the time, I just want people to call me Jim. I don't want anything to stand between hmm. me and them. So it, it's interesting because this aspect of, of the show, while it's so small, and it, it is certainly not trivial because it leads to a lot of conversations. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Rory Miller, but he... No. Um, he's written a number of books, uh, Meditations on Violence, I believe is his most famous one. Um, and he outright forbade me to call him anything other than Rory Miller. Yeah, Rory. <laughs> he said, no, no, that's what we're going to do. Um, so I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll default back to titles like Mr. or Mrs. with the guests on the show. Um, because one, one of the things that's interesting is, is you end up with these contrarians in the martial arts community who... You know, if if they started listening to an episode and they hear me introduce you as Jim, you know, they they would turn it off. And I think that that's so silly. But at the same time, I want them to be able to hear the conversation. So I bend a little bit. Well, you know, it's um, I think it's all right to be forthright and say just say it right out that all right, we're having a conversation with Grandmaster. Uh, James Keenan of Doto Kushinkai. Uh, in our conversations, you'll hear me refer to him as Jim. That's his personal preference. Yeah. And, and quite often that's what we do. Because, yeah. you know, when, when two people are talking, there's really no need to refer to anyone. It's, I mean, if I'm talking to someone, you know I'm talking to you. There's nobody else here and vice versa. You know, an example of this kind of titles getting in the way, my mother, was the principal of an elementary school not far from where we lived. And when my little sisters got big enough, they actually went to the school. And while they were at school, they had to call their mother, Mrs. Keenan. Mm. Can you imagine that? I mean, I was away uh, by that time. I was in the military. But um, when they told me, when my sisters told me that, I was just sort of facepalm. You know, it's like, what? I had friends that... Had to, had to deal with that. You know, I grew up in a, a small area in Maine and, you know, quite a few of my friends had parents that worked in the school system and in some capacity. And um, like I had a friend, Kelly, and her mother was the gym teacher. And if, you know, they, they would always try to make sure that, you know, kids weren't in the same classes as their parents. But if they had reason to have conversation with them publicly, it was, you know, it wasn't mom or dad. It was Mr. or Mrs. or whatever. And and it was weird. Yeah. Fred, there was a comedian named Fred Stoller. Uh, and he actually made a joke about this. He was in one of his stand up routines. He was talking about the close relationship he had with his mother. And he would often talk to her and, and say, Mrs. Stoller. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, he can, he can do that joke better than I can. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up next door to a preschool. And grew up with the, the two children that were born into that family and the, the older child, Katie, who was a couple years younger than I was, you know, she grew up around all of these children calling her mother, Barbara. And she was probably five before she, I mean, when she was very young, she would refer to her mother as mom, but then eventually she became Barbara. And then she switched back to mom eventually once she understood the difference, but everyone else was calling her Barbara. Why would she call her anything else? I always found that really interesting. Yeah. That's, yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> well, how about this? How about we completely sidestep uh, me introducing you and we just kind of run with what we've, we've been doing? Because I'll, I'll be honest, it's been a good conversation. I, it, would, it seems like a shame to cut it off and, and start, quote unquote, formally. Yeah, whatever you like. I'm at your okay. service. All right. Well, uh, you know, we'll, I'll do so, I'm going to record an intro and an outro later and yeah. At this point, the, the well, listeners don't know who you are. And go ahead. Was I when, I, when I was talking with Leslie on the phone yesterday, she told me you know she was about to take off for her trip to Japan, mm. and she said that uh, she would probably be listening to this on the plane. So I promised her I would be as interesting as I could be for her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure she appreci appreciates that. I certainly do. I'm sure everyone else does too. And. You know, we've done a few episodes like this where we just start talking and I think, you know, the audio quality is good. I don't, I don't want to start over. 
because we've yeah. already done the hard part, which is to to start building some rapport. And I noticed that when we hit that reset button, it it hits the reset button on that. We've kind of got to start over. So I'm going to launch into this quote unquote first question. Go right ahead. You now about how did you get started in the martial arts? Whoa! How much time do we have? This is a long story. All the time you want. Uh, when I was growing up, I was small, and I was also a late bloomer, so I was small up through the beginning of high school. Uh, I was by, at fourteen years old. I was five feet tall and ninety-eight pounds. I w- and I was very shrimpy. Uh, I had been. Uh, not just bullied, but abused by uh, older children, older boys. Uh, And so I had a very tough childhood to the point where sometimes I would um, come home from school and I would just get behind the couch in the living room and not come out. Uh, And my parents, you know, back in those days, this was different. We're talking about the 1950s. And so uh, there wasn't the same kind of awareness of things that we have today. And uh, so all these things were happening to me and my parents were, were blissfully unaware. Uh, even, you know, things would come up where I ran away from school in the middle of the day out of fear. Uh, and then I got in trouble for running away from school. <laughs> you know, and, and I would say to my, my mother, you know, they're, they're going to beat me up at lunchtime. I can't be there. And she, they're not going to beat you up. Go back to school. Anyway, so by the time I was 14, my father really became conscious that stuff was happening to me all the time. And um, he was a veteran of the Second World War. And he had seen enough combat that he. Um, you know, one of the things that combat veterans get is a desire not to foster more combat. You know, you get tired of combat. Uh, combat is a bad thing. You don't want to be in combat. War is not glorious, wonderful, and good. It's awful and horrible. And so my father was in that kind of headspace. And so he didn't want to teach his son to be violent. And I can remember him giving me pep talks about how much better a person I was than the people who were doing things to me and, you know, blah, blah, on and on like that. And I know even as a kid, there was a part of me that was going, okay, dad, that's great, but, you know, this is not helping me. So my father uh, at one point was teaching at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, He was teaching English. And lo and behold, there was somebody in his class who practiced karate. Now, this was really kind of exceptional back back in the day because, you know, martial arts, if you talk about martial arts in the United States in those days, you were talking about judo. And so to meet somebody who practiced karate was a little, a little unusual. And so my father got into a conversation with this young man and heard lots of things that he liked, you know, particularly the idea about uh, this wasn't just about violence, it was about personal development and spiritual things and blah, blah, and on and on. And so my father decided that maybe this was the thing for me. And so he actually introduced me to martial arts. And I started out uh, with Japanese karate because uh, a lot of the time in the United States at that time, if you were talking about karate, you were talking about Japanese karate. and once I discovered this and realized that this was a path to personal power for me, I became an absolute martial arts maniac um, because I was going from a position of extreme weakness and all I wanted was to be so powerful that nobody could ever do anything to me again. And, and that's where I started out, you know, um, at, by the time I was, I don't know, I think about 17 or 18, I was going to five different schools simultaneously. 
and none of the schools knew I was going to the others <laughs> because they all would have been, you know, like, wait, you're, you're in our style. Don't go to that style. And um, it was a typical day for me was at least 10 hours practice. And I did that for the first 12 years that I was, uh, that I was practicing because, uh, you know, until I got to the point where I was satisfied with my strength and ability, I didn't start to taper off. Because what happened at the beginning, I wanted to be strong. And so my practice emphasized everything that involved strength, um, breaking things. To, I, when, I, when I look back at, at the things that I did at that time, I'm sort of like, how in the world did you ever survive doing all this stuff? Uh, because I used to do crazy things to uh, develop my power and control. And I would set up devices uh, so that I could approximate what it would be like to crush a man's head on the floor. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> and uh, now what happened, of course, is that once I started to develop a certain level of strength, I realized I really didn't want to hurt people. That that wasn't the thing for my life. I didn't want to hurt people. So I started ratcheting, ratcheting it back. So I, I got to the point where, okay, instead of just hurting them, I will give them back everything they wanted to give me plus one. Mm -hmm. You know, like just a little bit of revenge thrown in there. And you know, after a while, I got to the point where I could do this consistently. And then I was like, you know, I really don't want to do that either. So then I got to the point where, okay, I'll, I'll just, I'll hurt them as little as I can. And then once I got to that point, then it was like, okay, I don't, I don't even really want to hurt them if there's no absolute requirement to hurt anybody. And so then I developed to the point where it was like, okay, I'm going to try to protect the person who is attacking me at the same time that I'm going to try and deny the consequences of what they're attempting to. And, and so it took me, you know, the better part of a decade to develop to that. And, and I was, um, I was very happy and all of my, I've been practicing in, studying now for 55 years and my life experience uh, because the f my first career was in security and anti-terrorism and, and you can see why I would get drawn into a career like that because my uh, my feeling of wanting to prevent myself from being harmed then started to extend to I want to protect others. I don't want anybody else to get hurt if I can help it. Uh, and so I, I got into a field where I could be the, uh, the, the sheepdog, you know, that stood between the sheep and the wolves. Yeah. And, um, and, and wow, that was just a long rambling thing. Oh, it was you, perfect. You get, to a, you get to a certain age and you start to think all your stories are just so interesting. <laughs> And the audience is sitting there yawning like. No, no. <laughs> the, the audience is used to this. So what, what you don't know, what a num you know, I, I don't know how often I express this uh, publicly on the show, but the original impetus for the format of this show was that I was tired of going to events, you know, testings, summer camps, things like that, and hanging out with, you know, the senior ranks. And they would get a couple beers in them or a couple, you know, shots of sake. <laughs> and they would start telling these stories that they would refuse to tell at other times. Oh, yeah. Because but, it didn't, you know, it seemed appropriate in that moment, but it didn't seem appropriate to them after class or during class or, you know, in a more, let's say, public and professional space. And I said, everything we're going to do with this show is to get people to tell these stories. Because of all the aspects of martial arts that we have that are chronicled, these are the ones that aren't. Mm -hmm. And so that's my, my little mission with this show is to make sure that these stories that 
you know, we, we've got a ton of people listening, not immediately right now because we're not live, but we have a ton of people listening to this show, to that story you just told. And I bet you every single one of them kind of shook their head when you said rambling and people yawning because this is why they tune in. Well, hi to all you people out there. I'm glad you're listening. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. Otherwise, we're a couple crazy people just you know, <laughs> talking over microphones to each other, put it out there and nobody listens. That, um, yeah, I think that. So that when, was, I, when I started out, I, I was doing Shotokan, Shorenru, Ishinru, Chungdo Kwan, uh, and Judo, you know, Kodokan Judo. And by the time I got in the military in 1970, I thought that I was the hottest thing since, you know, sliced bread. I was great. I was tremendous. And so um, I got sent to the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California to learn Chinese. And uh, not long after uh, the classes started, they had a party for uh, the students and the teachers. So naturally at the party with all the Chinese teachers, I was talking about my favorite subject. Because in those days, you couldn't talk to me unless you wanted to talk about martial arts. You know, it'd be, hi, how are you? Fine, look at my punch. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm there and I'm talking about, oh, karate, karate, rah, 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 I'm so great. And um, one of the teachers was an elderly lady. Her name is Chen Mei Li. And the other Chinese teachers, while they were listening to me, boast. They were saying, well, you know, we, we Chinese have our martial arts too. Very laid back like that. And so I didn't realize it, but they suckered me into doing a demonstration with Chun Mei Li. And so what was, what the demonstration from my point of view was going to be was I was going to do a straight punch as fast and as hard as I could at Chun Mei Li's face and stop it an inch away. You know, like back in those days, uh, when you practiced those arts, you practiced control to the maximum degree uh, so that you could stop your, your technique any place and never hit unless you really meant to hit. And I expected to do this punch and have her be all startled and all the Chinese people would be going, oh, oh my God, oh God, you're so great. All right, so I remember starting to do the punch. And the next thing I knew, I was on my stomach on the floor and she was kind of breaking my wrist, elbow and shoulder more or less in that order. <laughs> now, what I didn't know was she was like, I think 65 and she'd been practicing martial arts since she was five. And she was the teacher of all the other teachers there. So they got a big kick out of that. I didn't realize until I'd seen enough Kung Fu movies later that I, I had been acting exactly like the Japanese bad guy in, mm. in the Kung Fu movies. And she had given me my Jet Li comeuppance. So because I, my, uh, the thrust of all my training, and this continues to this day, is to develop high skill rather than just be a devotee of one particular style. I want to develop global high skill in martial arts. And so I recognized that her skill was something I had never seen before in my life. So I just started, uh, you know, following her around like a little dog at her heels, just begging me to, begging her, teach me, teach me, teach me, teach me. And she would not. One of the things that we don't realize now, if you're growing up in the martial arts world of today, is that back in the 70s, it was not, not particularly common for Chinese martial arts teachers to accept Western students. I think there was, um, I, I may be wrong about this and somebody should correct me and I will be happy to be corrected. I think it was Arkwai Wong in Los Angeles who was one of the first to accept Western students uh, and teach them publicly. And my understanding is he got a lot of flack over that. But anyway, I followed her around like this and uh, 
I bought a book. Uh, you know, I asked one of the Chinese teachers, what did she do? What did she do to me? What, what martial art did she use? And now the fact of the matter was Chun Mei Li knew a lot of different arts. But this person told me, oh, she used uh, Taiji, Taiji martial art. I was like, oh, I never heard of that before. Never heard of that. So I went looking for stuff. No internet. You know, I had to go to bookstores. And I found a book. It was called Bruce Tegner's Complete Book of Kung Fu and Tai Chi. Of course, I didn't know how to say it then. I thought it was Tai Chi. And so I got this book and I'm looking at the pictures and I'm, and I'm thinking, oh, this is, you know, just like, like the forms that I knew where it went abruptly from one thing to the next. And so I uh, tried to start learning Tai Chi from this book. And after I had learned a few movements, I, I went to her office and I said, look, I really, really want to learn. I, I learned from this book here. I'm, what should we do this? It's Tai Chi. And I started to do it. And I'm going basically, huh, huh, huh. <laughs> and she's looking at me like I just grew two heads. <laughs> and uh, and she, she just sort of patted her hand toward me and said, no, Mr. Keenan, <laughs> like this. And she stood up and she started to do uh, the beginning of a yang style Tai Chi form. Now, of course, I didn't know that's what was happening at that time, but she started doing it. I had never seen movement like this. I had never seen this. This was like revolutionary to me. And it was so amazing. I felt like I couldn't even see her movement. I couldn't, I couldn't tell what she was doing. But she still wouldn't teach me. I was relentless. And finally, one of the, the teachers told me that every day at lunchtime, she led all the teachers in Tai Chi practice in one of the, the big empty classrooms. And I remember this woman, her last name was Fung. And she told me that Mrs. Chun was going to allow me to come into that room while they practiced. And Mrs. Fung took me in the room. She stood me in a back corner and she said, don't talk to anybody. Try and do what we do. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm standing in the back and I'm watching them and I can't really tell what they're doing. And I'm just really, eh, 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 just jerking around. But I, once I was there, I didn't go away. And I was terrible. Then one day I showed up uh, when there was supposed to be class and there was no class. Nobody was there. And a matter of fact, the whole school building was empty. And I'm looking around, where is everybody? And I, and I bumped into one of the men teachers who was still there. And I said, where is everybody? He told me that her father had just died. And they were all going down to the funeral. And so I, I, I begged him, please just wait, wait for a second. And I ran back to my barracks room and I had a suit. And I put it on and I went... And we went to the funeral. I was the only non-Chinese person at the funeral. And my Chinese was not very good at the time. And so he stood me next to him and he said, just do everything I do. And I did. Uh, and she came from a, a Chinese Christian family. So when they sang uh, Christian hymns in Chinese, I was basically just, ma -ma 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 -ma, you know, trying to pretend like I was singing. And when they stood, I stood, and they sat, I sat. And then at the end, everybody filed up and did three ceremonial bows to the minister, uh, you know, one by one each person, and then three ceremonial bows to the coffin where her father lay, and then three ceremonial bows to her standing by her mother. And so I just followed the person and I did everything they did. And when I got over to her and I did the three bows, she took my hand and I, she had heavy veils on, but I could see through her veils, there were, she had tears on her cheeks. And she just took my hand in both of her hands and just said, thank you, Mr. Keenan. Now what's interesting about this whole thing is not just that I 
sort of did this cultural experience. Her father was Hollington Tong. Look him up, Hollington Tong. He was a bigwig in the nationalist Chinese government and was very well known in the United States. Uh, he had been an ambassador. He was, if, if you look at Hollington, that's yeah, spelled I'm, pretty I'm, much the, the way it sounds. And I'm Tong, T O N G. She was Hollington Tong's daughter. And I was the only non Chinese person at Hollington Tong's funeral. But to go on from there, I, I thought it was kind of a shame. Well, after I learned, because at the time I had no idea who Hollington Tong was. And um, later on after I learned, I thought it was a shame that nobody from the US government had done anything. But that was the point where my relationship with her changed. And I think this was Again, this is so long ago, my, my old brain is not remembering everything right. I think this is early 71, 1971. Yep, that's what I'm seeing. And um, after that, it was like I had stepped through a door and I was now no longer on the outside, I was on the inside. And from there on, she became kind of like a, a mother to me. And instead of just going to this this uh, lunchtime class i used to be go over to her house she she tried she had uh, two sons and her sons apparently weren't interested in martial arts at all uh and her her family name uh, that that's romanized there is tong in chinese it's dong and she told me she she learned bagua zhang and she learned she said from her uncle now, the founder of Bagua Zhang, his last name was Dong. And so I'm guessing they came from the same clan, even if they weren't, uh, you know, directly related. And Dong Haichuan, I don't think he was alive. She was born in the, uh, I think, either the late 1800s or the early 1900s. So that... Uh, there was a heyday for Bagua in China in the 1930s. And so she would have been part of that heyday, you know, prior to the uh, revolution. But she was, she was so amazing. She could, she could throw coins, multiple coins, uh, by holding them between her fingers and flicking them like a ninja. <laughs> <laughs> it was astounding. And, she, because she came from an aristocratic family, one of the things that happens with, with uh, these families is that they'll be big. You have a big clan, and there are lots of different terms of address, depending on where you are. You know, if you're talking to someone who's senior to you or junior to you, and the way they that they can keep track of that, particularly in the male line, is there'll be a big family poem, and boys from a certain generation will have a particular character from that poem in their name. So that if they're talking to somebody else, the other person they're, uh, they're uh, talking with will recognize where they are in the poem. And so they know if this person is their elder or their junior. So I had a Chinese name up to that point, which, uh, literally translated as Keenan who can do one thing. <laughs> <laughs> not the best, not the best. She gave me a new Chinese name. And the, the wonder and brilliance for me of it is she gave me the same character from her family poem as her sons. And I was, I was super touched, super touched. So anyway, she, so that's a long story about, that <laughs> that's that's you know powerful though and, and if i if i can ask a question oh yeah sure go you know it, it's it's clear that in that moment where you're you're demonstrating your skill you're throwing this this punch and meaning to you know impress everyone around you 
Oh yeah. And you wind up on the floor, which ironically, or maybe not so ironically, uh, the most gifted Tai Chi instructor that I've been able to work with did roughly the same thing. I knew something was coming. I knew I wasn't going to <laughs> demonstrating my prowess, but the, uh, the speed with which I was laid out and gently, I might add, was utterly phenomenal. And I, I made him demonstrate it several more times. There were plenty of people around because I just, I couldn't, it was so fast. I couldn't pick up on anything. Right. But it's, it's easy to make the, the physical concession in that moment. Hey, there's, there's something here that I want to learn. There's more than what I've been taught, et cetera. But up until that point, it sounds like you had formed this new identity and taken a lot of strength back from oh, your martial arts practice. That's a fact. Did, did that moment, did that unsettling of what you had learned, did that change your your identity that that new understanding of who you were that's really an interesting question and i don't think anybody has ever asked me that uh for as many times as i've i've told that story um no i would have to say no and i think and this uh this is this is my first reaction i think that the reason it did not was that I did not view her or the Chinese as being in the position of being potential oppressors of me. Uh, whereas my initial karate training had started and developed as a reaction against those who had hurt me before. My approach here was really, this is a new world. I, I've already sort of conquered the other world, so I'm not worried about that. And I'm not worried about this elderly lady, you know, suddenly bullying me or anything like that. Uh, for me, this was, this was like a new kind of wonderland. And, and rather than being put off by it, I was, I was attracted to it. The thing is that if you ever get to the point, and I have to say, and this is, it used to distress me a lot more. Now it's, it's just a sort of nagging disappointment that sits in the back of my mind all the time, is I'll meet lots of martial artists. And I, I, I meet them, and they're very nice people. And some of them have trained for decades. But at a certain point, they decided they they knew it. They had arrived, and they stopped. Uh, I can't tell you the number of people who I've met who trained twenty years, but in fact they trained one year and then repeated that for nineteen more, because they stopped after their first year because they thought, okay, I've got it now, or they stopped when they reached uh, shodan black belt. When they reached black belt, they stopped because now they were black belt. You know, I know I am. This and and then they just walk around and hold their belt and go hut hut and uh, expect everybody to bow, and their practice died. And it's a very important thing to me to keep a live practice all the time, and that's what my practice was at the time that I met Chun Mei Lee. It was it was nowhere near as developed in scope or in depth as became and continues to become, but uh, I was sort of on the right track of being open. One of the things I tell people who I train now is the less ego you have in your practice, the better your practice is going to be, and the higher your skill is going to be, uh, the more selfless you can be in your practice, the higher your skill is going to end up being. And I think that by the time I met her, I had started to, to enter that space. I wasn't very far in. You know, there's, there's a Chinese saying, uh, don't be afraid to go slow, just be afraid to stand still. Well, I was taking these little baby steps very slowly, and I was, I was uh, getting into that, that head space where I was developing more and more an egoless practice 
and a, a more selfless practice. And, and when I say at that point that I was starting to develop an egoless, selfless practice, what I mean is I was all ego and I was all self because I was nowhere near it. I was nowhere near it. And uh, that allowed me to accept the new horizon in a, in a way that did not, didn't affect me badly at all. See, one of the things that happened uh, as part of this whole development process, I was happy to test my skills against other people. But I, I always tested those skills in sort of not a competition format, but in a challenge fight format where it's like, okay, if, if you uh, want to test your skill, I'm happy to engage with you, but it's going to be a no hold barred fight and I'm going to hurt you. And everybody who was willing to do that, I was happy to, to, to work with them on that. And I continued on that path till, well, actually, I'm not off that path. I'll still do it. But uh, up until I went to California in 1975, after I got out of the service, which was 1974, I went back to Pittsburgh, my hometown, and stayed there for a while, and then went to California. And that's where I first started teaching Bagua publicly. I remember telling the karate students in Pittsburgh that I knew a system that was so good that it made everything else seem like, like nothing. And I would be happy to teach it to them if they wanted to learn it. But their, their heads were really in the sort of karate space. And they didn't, they didn't want to learn. I had only been training since 1970. So it's pretty nervy of me to think in 1975 that I could start teaching this. But I, I went to California and started to, uh, started to teach openly in Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz. That's where I was. And there was, it was quite a bit of martial arts there at the time and people did come to challenge me and I always accepted their challenges and, and they always left either wanting to become my student or upset. <laughs> uh, and there was an Aikido club up at uh, UC Santa Cruz at the time. And there was also a Shotokan club up there. And the Shotokan guys kept beating the Aikido guys up and the Aikido guys were all upset about that because you know they had a, a high opinion of their aikido and aikido was supposed to be so great and yet how could these shotokan people knock them around so somebody had seen me practicing and one of the things about bagua is that people tend to see in it what their own background is so that if somebody comes from a karate background they think oh bagua is so much like karate or if they come from an Aikido background, a Jiu-Jitsu background, they're like, oh, Bagua really is very Aikido-ish and Jiu-Jitsu-ish and so on. Or if they come from a Taiji background, they'll be like, oh, Bagua is really kind of like Taiji, isn't it? So anyway, these, these Aikido guys saw me and they, they heard that I was doing all these challenge fights and I was, I was consistently coming out on top. So they came down and introduced themselves and asked what I showed. And so I, I showed them just as anybody nowadays could, but back then it was sort of magical. Uh, I showed them, if you're an Aikido practitioner and you have to face somebody who's doing this kind of style, here's what to do. And they were like, oh, wow, this is so amazing. And then one of them turned out to be a guy who wrote for various martial arts magazines. And so they wanted to do an article about Bagua for Black Belt magazine. And so I was like, okay, you know, it's fine with me. And so this guy came and interviewed me. And then it, he said, okay, we want to take some photographs. And I said, okay. And then they he said, well, you know, this is Black Belt Magazine. They want you to wear a karate gi for the photos. And I'm like, uh, you know, this is a Chinese art, right? <laughs> this, is, this is not karate. 
and well, yeah, but you know, I'm not, so I'm like, all right, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. So they took the pictures, and he wrote this article, and then the, before publication, they sent me the article. They said, if there's anything incorrect here, uh, would you please just pencil it in and then send this back to us before we publish the article? They had spelled Bagua wrong everywhere. Now, in the Wade Giles romanization, Bagua is spelled P-A-K-U-A, but this is pronounced Ba-Wa. It's a quirk of the romanization. They had spelled it P-A-Q-U-A, as if it was Pakwa, which I've, I've heard, you know, as a common mispronunciation by people who don't actually know how to say the name correctly, Agua. So I dutifully went through every place they had P-A-Q-U-A. I crossed out the Q, put a K, crossed out the Q, put a K. Sent it back to them. And sure enough, it's published in Black Belt Magazine. Pa-Qua, P-A-Q-U-A. And so this was, I don't know, the September issue of Black Belt, 1977, I think. If it's not September, it's May. I don't, I don't really remember. Um, but it's one of the others. Uh, on the, what I do remember is on the cover, there's some Korean uh, martial artist who is kicking somebody in the face, I think. But uh, so you can look that up. I think all those old Black Belt magazines are on uh, Google now. Mm. Oh, so that you can so actually cool. look and the cover you know it's it's it turned out to be one of those articles where every other sentence is completely wrong <laughs> <laughs> i remember somebody brought me a book about internal arts once and they they said could you could you look at this book for me and tell me what are the good things in it and so i looked and i said okay the first half of this sentence is okay Second half, forget that. You know, <laughs> the whole book was like that. Well, this article was like that. And the on the cover, you know, consider remember the the origin of all this was because I came to people's attention for all the challenge fights, right? So on the cover it says the martial art that rarely gets tested. What? <laughs> the whole point was it was being tested all the time. <laughs> so if you're curious and you have a lot of spare time, <laughs> I invite you to look that up uh, on Google. And the funniest thing about it was it was the 70s. I had long hair, okay? A woman who came and took some lessons from me was also in um, hairdressing school. And she had just learned how to give a permanent. So she said, hey, for practice, could I give you a permanent? <laughs> and so I was like, oh, all right, all right. Because the thing with hair, you know, this is you get a bad haircut, it'll grow back. Or you can cut it off, start over again. So she gave me a, uh, a perm. And so all the pictures in this article, I look like a Q-tip. I've got this big, poofy hairdo, very 70s, very 70s. After my brother saw this, he wrote me a, a letter and said, I take back every good thing I've ever said about you since 1954. <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of hilarious. But the, the thing is, I was the first, the first non-Asian uh, who ever got featured in uh, a national martial arts magazine for, for uh, Bagua. So that was something. Then uh, let's see. I'm just rambling again. I'm, and I mean, I this is the hallmark of the show. This is what we do. I have not given you the chance to say anything. People don't want to hear about me. <laughs> I'm sure 430 that's... something episodes in. They've heard a lot of me. They're, oh. they're excited to hear from other people at this point. <laughs> they're already tired of you. Okay. <laughs> they, oh, they were tired of me. Episode 50. Well, I'll tell you by the end of this episode, they'll be tired of me too. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's how you know it's the right amount. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're when you're teaching a class, you you want to 
you don't you don't want to end class when they're still hungry to learn more. You want to you want to ride it out to the bitter end. So they, that's they, right until they so they leave and they're bruised and bloody like, and get me my- out of here, get <laughs> me out. of here. But you know you mentioned bruised and bloody. Uh, in the old days, see, I started in 1965, and back in those days, um, everybody was into pain. You were expected to get injured. You were expected to like go to class and come out damaged every time. And part of the training was uh, that you were supposed to suck it up and never show that you had been hurt you know, keep up this cool demeanor, no matter what, even if, you know, your insides were falling out. Uh, I got most of the, the lifelong injuries that I ever received. I got most of those in the first few years of my training. And somehow, uh, and just to give you an idea, uh, jaw dislocated, uh, intercostal cartilage, uh, my rib cage kicked out on both sides, uh, my left leg dislocated from the socket, uh, my uh, left arm, forearm broken. Uh, and these are just not counting all the lumps and bruises. And <clears throat> at that time, I always had the feeling in the back of my mind that Someday I would teach this. Someday I would be teaching martial art. And so I really paid attention to everybody who ever taught me. And I've had a lot of teachers over 55 years. And I would observe, okay, this is good. Remember to to follow that example. This is bad. Don't do that. And over the years, I came up with sort of a code, a list of rules for teachers and everybody who's ever trained with me and become a teacher follows these rules. And the first rule, and all of these rules I consider to be absolutely unbreakable. First rule is it's the duty of the teacher to protect the student while the student is learning. That seems logical, doesn't it? It does. I hear I'm getting beat up outside, so I want to learn how to defend myself. So I go to a school and now I'm going to pay money and get beat up. It was cheaper for me just to stay out on the street and get beat up than to come into the school and get beat up. (laughs) Now, this is not to say that um, students don't need to learn how to deal with hardship. Don't need to learn how to test their own boundaries and learn that they're actually capable of doing much more than they may think. But I had teachers who would, um, when they would go around and they'd be correcting, correcting your posture, correcting your leg or your arm, they didn't just tell you. They had a stick and they hit you. If your leg was out of place, they whacked you on the leg. No, no, sorry. And some of these practices were, inherited from some Asian practices, honestly. You know, those things happened in China. Those things happened in Japan, in Okinawa. Uh, There's a lot of historical revisionism now. Uh, I've I've noticed people uh, changing histories so that whitewash bad things. I've been around long enough that, like I was there, you know, I saw it. So, uh, so that when somebody tells me now, oh, this is how it was then. No, no. I'm glad you think that, but I don't bother correcting most people. First off, because so many of the people who I knew are dead. And so what does it matter anymore? You know, otherwise I would go directly to that person and help straighten them out. But, uh, How did I get off on that? I don't know how I got off on that. We were wandering. That's okay. That's, we're just we're just wandering. Let's let's take a hard left. I mean, we get we got sure. the, the chance now. So, so I went to Israel. Mm-hmm. I got, I got a job there as a, a 
head of security at an installation. And I started, I've been teaching continually uh, for 50 years now. And just this spring, we had a big celebration of uh, 50th, my 50th anniversary. And so I went to Israel and I started teaching there immediately. I, I found a local judo school. Uh, it was run by a gentleman named Natan Isinger. Uh, and he, uh, I think his, he called his school the Budokan or something like that. It was a, a small school, but it was nice. And so uh, I said that I wanted to teach and that he could have all the money. I just wanted to teach. And so I started teaching there. The, the Israelis, this was 1980. The Israelis at the time, and I think they're probably still this way, they're all from Missouri. In other words, you, you have to show them. You can't just tell them stuff. So that if you walked in and said, oh, hi, I have X degree black belt, they would say, oh, that's really nice. Let's fight. <laughs> you know? just, just like that. I want to see. Uh, so I had the first two years I was in Israel, you know, we talk about challenge fights. I was fighting all the time. And uh, I remember there, there was one man, he, he became my student. He was the leader of a street gang. His, uh, his street name in Hebrew was Shed, which means demon. <laughs> he had already been kick, kicked out of uh, some martial arts schools for being too violent. So he showed up and he wanted to fight me. And I'm like, okay, okay, if you want to fight, and, you know, and I sort of laid out what was going to happen. And, and I said, but I can tell you right now, my, my skill is too high for you, that you don't stand any chance. Uh, I'm a master of this. And he said, oh, that's okay. I, I like to know what it feels like to get beat up by a master. <laughs> that, this is just so, this, is, this was very Israeli. So, uh, you know, three minutes later, he was like, oh, can I be your student? Can I be your student? Uh, and I let him, and it, it turned out to be a really good thing for him because he dropped out of the gang, he changed his life, he ended up getting a job, getting married, having kids. It was really, it was really a transformational experience for him. Uh, but after I had been there two years, I had established such a good reputation that now whenever there was any martial arts event in Israel, I was always there as a guest of honor. So for instance, uh, Dennis Hanover, who is a remarkable old time martial artist, he and I were friends at that time. Uh, he did Kyokushin Kai and his stories, boy, he's got some great stories. He did the first full contact uh, tournament in Israel ever. And um, he decided that he needed a halftime show. So he invited one person to be the halftime show for his full contact tournament. You know where this is going. It was me. I do. I do. <laughs> so, but, uh, and, and whenever, you know, say, uh, Japanese martial artists from the JKA, you know, they would come to visit Israel and it would be a big deal. Uh, they, they always got, brought to meet me, uh, they'd have a, a tournament and I'd be sitting on the, uh, the dais of honor next to the, the JKA representative, that sort of thing. So I started to get really well known. And then one of the guys who started training with me, he said, you know, in Israel, we have this fighting system, it's called Krav Maga. And the founder of Krav Maga lives, you know, about a half an hour south of here. And how about you, you guys meet up? That would be a really cool thing. So Emi Lichtenfeld, that's, uh, that's the name of the guy. Now Emi, Emi at this time was, uh, actually he was pretty close to the age I am now because I'm just about to turn 71. And I think Emi might have been, 70, 71, two or three, something like this. So they brought him this, they brought him up, Amy, to meet me. And that was another really important turning point 
for me because uh, I thought that I had already pretty much reached the perfection of self-defense. Uh, that I had throughout all the years and all the systems, and by, by this time, I had picked up advanced ranks in a number of different martial arts. And when I say picked up, I actually mean earned. Um, and I had synthesized a lot of these, uh, these things sort of cross system so that I had a, what I thought was a very integrated and complete system for self-defense that, you know, wasn't uh, solely oriented toward one type of art, but that included things from many different streams. And so I met Emi, and Emi and I hit it off right away. We just hit it off right away. And so for the next five years, I guess it was, uh, I was, in the beginning, I was with Emi almost every day. And after that, I was with him just several times a week. They had a list of all of the material that was in the Krav Maga curriculum. And essentially, I made Emi defend to me every single one of the techniques as being the best, as being the best possible technique for a given situation. Now, what's What's interesting about this is that at the time, Krav Maga was not very, very well known or, or known at all, really, outside of Israel. I think at the time there were, there was one guy in Philadelphia who had taken a Krav Maga course and that he was teaching there. Um, and that was it. By the time I got back, to the United States in 1987, I think besides me, there were only three people in the United States who were teaching Krav Maga, one in New York, one in California, and one in Philadelphia. Then there was me. Um, but I approached Emi from a different direction than the average person because it was, I had a high reputation in Israel. Everybody already thought I was a master. And I came essentially with master's credentials and with a, a deep knowledge uh, and broad knowledge of fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, in general. And so at that time, because Krav Maga was looked at by the average Israeli as being just, uh, that's just, you know, basic self-defense, your average martial artist in Israel had the opinion of Krav Maga that, well, Krav Maga is just my arts, simple self-defense, that's all. What's the big deal? Well, it's actually much greater than that, but they didn't respect it, so they didn't uh, investigate it. And I investigated it with Emi in great detail. And Emi, I think, had the, the same kind of mentality as me, or that I had the same as him, uh, when it came to wanting to do the absolute very best and never being satisfied, wanting to have the highest possible skill. And the, uh, Amy appreciated that in me. And because I wasn't a, just a Krav Maga student, in other words, I hadn't learned Krav Maga and nothing else, Amy was able to talk to me in ways that he was not able to talk to the Israeli Krav Maga instructors. And he was also able to hear things from me that he couldn't hear from anybody else because I had, in effect, established myself with him as a reliable source of information. And so the upshot was that Emi used to call all the Krav Maga instructors in Israel to seminars that I would teach at the Wingate National Sports Institute. Uh, and a lot of what I taught then was uh, adapted into the body of Krav Maga, and it's still there today. 
uh, you won't hear that much because it doesn't fit the narrative of uh, Israeli martial art because you're going to now have to say, oh, Israeli martial art plus all that stuff that Jim Keenan put in it. <laughs> 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 and and for people who don't know the story of Krav Maga, we did an episode on it, and we'll make sure that we link it in the show notes. But for people who don't know that narrative, as a a, a non-Israeli and uh, I'm I'm going to take a, a a guess here, a non-Jewish individual. Yes, non-Jew, deal. non-Israeli. That's a, that was a big deal. I was the first person for the first uh, non-Israeli, non-Jew ever to receive the highest rank in Krav Maga and to be given a teaching license. Everybody else was uh, from that cultural or religious background. Uh, You said you did an episode on Krav Maga. Who were you talking to about Krav Maga? We weren't. This was just a collection of research. We, we, you know, dug through books and websites and just cobbled Ah. together. Well, unfortunately, and I apologize in advance to all those people out there who are sincerely trying to practice Krav Maga now, but Krav Maga in the United States is not very high quality. And there are long and complicated reasons for that. But the main reason is that uh, Emi Lichtenfeld had a very solid uh, theoretical foundation for everything he did. And he was constantly talking about it. And he, he was telling the uh, Israeli instructors as well, I am the only person in the world who I ever hear talking about Emi's theoretical foundation, even though some of the stuff was so simple. Uh, I'm just going to give you one example. Please. Amy said that every, uh, in order for a technique to be optimal as a self defense technique, it had to satisfy five criteria. It had to be the shortest, the fastest, the strongest, the most natural, and to the point. And the, to the point is the governor there. But all five of those things had to be true at the same time. So that It has to be the shortest under the circumstances, the fastest under the circumstances, the strongest under the circumstances, and the most natural under the circumstances. And the circumstances are dictated by what's the point. In other words, is it defense against a punch, defense against a knife, defense against a grab, you know, anything like that. And those five things, Amy repeated them like a mantra. In the years that I was in Israel, I couldn't even tell you how many times uh, I heard Amy say this in the presence of not just me, but the, all the other Israeli instructors. And uh, most of them have drifted really far away from that. And you can look at their, the techniques they teach, and you can just objectively dismantle them just based on that. Why do you think that is? Uh, there are so many pressures. There are so many pressures. Like, for instance, one of the, one of the negative pressures that affects um, Krav Maga now is MMA. That Krav Maga people think that they need to be a better MMA than the MMA people. When that's not, that's not correct. That is just not correct. Uh, also, something that causes drift and this is true, uh, and again, this is all my opinion, and I could just be full of it, but um, something that causes drift in schools in general is that you have the need to pay the bills, which means that student retention becomes an important thing. And so you have to do things to retain the students so they'll keep paying from month to month. and Sometimes that means doing things that just entertain them. Introducing things, oh, this will be fun to do. You know, when it might not have anything to do with really trying to give a clean transmission of the martial art. 
I mean, you see what I'm talking about? I do. Yeah. Uh, and and I, so I see that all over the place. And and sometimes I'll refer to uh, in Krav Maga uh, sense. I'll I'll talk about Krav Matainment. <laughs> you know, <laughs> where you've got this combination of Krav Maga and entertainment, so that you've got somebody who comes in. It's their second class. Okay, we're going to do defenses against knife. Wait, this is their second class. One of the things that Emi built into the Krav Maga system is that the techniques you learn at the beginning form the foundation for all the techniques by the end so that you can sort of see the stream. So if you haven't learned the beginning techniques, you really can't do the advanced techniques correctly. It would be like, okay, welcome to my class. I know this is your first class, but we're going to learn the tornado kick today because it's really fun. Mm. No. I mean, it might end up being fun. But if you want to give a good transmission, that's not the way to do it. Uh, at least, I don't think that's the way to do it. Uh, and, and another thing that I've seen corrupting uh, Krav Maga practices. A second principle that Emi emphasized was that an application, a self-defense response, had to work 99% of the time for 99% of the target audience. That's really important. 99.99. And the target audience can change. So, for instance, something that will work when you are a special forces troop. You might not be able to do that if you're an elderly person. <laughs> so you have to have a technique that's gonna work 99% of the time for your target audience if they're elderly, if they're young, if they're strong military age, if they're mi middle age, see? And where this, uh, you'll see a fail in this, is you'll get some strong teacher. And it's typically a guy. I don't mean to be sexist by saying he, and I don't mean to be excluding women, but he will go boom, boom, and do this technique and say, see, this is great. Now everybody do that. And the reason the technique works is because of him, his size, his strength, his particular ability. The technique won't actually be keyed to the target audience. See what I mean? Yeah. And so then you'll get some, some small person, like imagine me when I was 14, and I'm trying to do the big muscle technique that, that the guy just showed, and then I'm wondering why it's not working or why it's so hard for me to do it. It's because I should have been doing something else. There was another thing that would have been better for me, my personal target audience would have been better for me to do. So I just realized uh, I... Some, at some point, I pulled out the soapbox and I climbed up on it and I just started to rant. <laughs> I'm really sorry. It's all good. This is, this is what we do. This is what we do. And I'm, the thing, I'm the, yeah. The, what I was just going to say, the thing is, I don't just have these things as an opinion. And here we're talking and, and this is a lovely program. And it's great for what it is, but martial arts is not about talking. Martial arts is about doing. Right. And, and so someone can say, well, I heard that blowhard Jim Keenan, he said this. <laughs> and fine, okay, yeah, maybe that blowhard Jim Keenan did say that. But if you are with me, I can show you and let you feel it in yourself and for yourself what's, what's, uh, effective and what's not effective. I can show you what your basic assumptions are so that you're, you have to make these assumptions before you can get to here. And you might not be making the right assumptions about stuff. And so when you get together physically, suddenly everything can be much clearer and much more comprehensible. And, and we're not sitting here being keyboard warriors and going, da, 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 da. I just told him, I'm going to wear your nutsack for a hat. You know? 
<laughs> so that's a new, I'm going to use that one. That's a new one. I like that. I'm, I, I'll be honest. I'm not sure who's getting the better end of that exchange, but it's a wonderful visual. <laughs> Amy passed away in 1998. Yeah. And my relationship with Amy was very close. I, I typically addressed him as father. And, um, excuse me. Yeah, it's okay. Take your time. Sometimes it's hard for me to talk uh, about Amy because. I just, I love him so much. It's not a matter that I loved him because the love is undying. So when I came back to the United States, um, that's when I met John Luping. John Luping, uh, a really excellent martial artist. I was introduced to him by some friends of mine from West Virginia. And they were like, you've really got to meet this guy. He's, he's really something. And, and I did. And my first impression, I was like, I said to my friend, yeah, you know, what he's doing, uh, give me a year of practice and I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> uh, see, I said that I was still on that path of less ego and <laughs> more selflessness. Clearly in 1987, I had. It takes time. Yeah, it takes a lot. Of time. Anyway. Um, Lu Ping and I became good friends. And, and I think of him like a brother. He also passed away in 1998. Uh, so this was like a double whammy, big blow to me. Lu Ping's, the wonder of Lu Ping, uh, and Lu Ping's big contribution to my personal practice was his emphasis on body structure. And uh, once, once I understood what he was talking about, it sort of revolutionized uh, my physical performance in every way so that I, I could easily differentiate when I, I could use full body power, partial body power, or any percentage from 100 to, to zero of body power, uh, just structurally and in movement. Uh, and he was not so, he taught, but he was not so much a teacher as a researcher. And I think this is why he and I became such good friends is because he had, uh, a, a resonance with my desire to get high skill, just get high skill globally. And he wanted to have high skill. And so he would just constantly research and try and analyze and experiment and do different things. And he had a pretty deep background in Chinese martial arts. Uh, and yeah, that's, I think that's the most I want to say about Lu Ping outside of how wonderful he was as a person. Sure. He was a mathematician and he was teaching at UMass Amherst. He, he, I, I told one of my friends who was also a kind of advanced mathematician what Lu Ping taught at the university. And my friend said, that stuff is really hard. It's like you, you've got to be a brainiac to, to get, it was something like partial differential nonlinear equations or, I mean, I don't understand. I'm lucky I can add two and two and get five. But um, he, so Lu Ping's intellect was very strong and he had uh, in the martial arts side had a strong physical skill to back it up. What he did not have was much fighting experience. And because I had a lot of fighting experience at the time. So we sort of just bounced off each other all the time. He had things I didn't have. I had things he didn't have. And so, so we just, we were like that for, from 1987 until he passed away. Um, and now all of the people who taught me have passed away. It's this weird thing. You, know, you, you get to a certain age and people are just falling off the conveyor belt, you know? 
we're all riding the conveyor belt till we get to our predetermined end. And suddenly you look around and you see a lot of people have fallen off and you're still there. And you're like, what? Where did they all go? Yeah. So, uh, so all of my closest, uh, closest friends and teachers, they're, they're not with us anymore. Has and all the I, your relationship to your training? Um, I often feel, and I'm just going to like say this right out and it's very naked and vulnerable and I understand and, yeah, and, like and us martial arts masters aren't supposed to be naked and vulnerable because we're tough and karate man hides his pain inside. And <laughs> Sometimes I just get lonely. Mm. Sometimes I just get lonely because when you have practiced for like over a half a century, most of the people that you meet will be people who want to learn from you, not people who have somehow exceeded you and, and you want to learn from them. You know, we learn from each other all the time. So I'm not talking about that natural human interaction that enriches each one of us constantly. Um, I'm talking about, wow, you have a skill that I have never seen in my life. After 55 years, I've seen most of the skills. And I've seen super excellent practitioners. And I've seen lots of people who, who don't have the same attitude as me, you know, where their quest is for open-ended high skill. I was in an Ishinru conference uh, a couple of decades ago, and I was teaching a bunch of black belts things. And one of the black belts asked me about, I had studied all these different martial arts. And he said, didn't I ever hear the saying that one dog can't chase two rabbits? And I said, yes, I had heard that saying. I hope everybody out there in the audience has heard that saying. Essentially, it means you're not supposed to split your attention. Uh, but I said, yes, I had heard that saying. But what was the rabbit? Was the rabbit a particular style? Or was the rabbit high skill in martial art? What did he say? He didn't have anything to say. <laughs> he just looked at me like, oh, didn't think of that. <laughs> And I suspect there are a lot of people who haven't thought of it that way. I'll, I'll be honest. That's probably the most articulate way of expressing something I've always felt. So that's, that's always been my rabbit. And the thing is, I, I would describe my martial arts practice as an internal practice in the sense of, you know, if we have external arts and internal arts, um, although I am adept at many of these so-called external arts, my overarching practice is really Bagua. And Bagua is the quintessential internal art. The uh, difference for, uh, it may be that most of the audience already knows the difference between internal and external, but, uh, if you're practicing in a mode of externality, everything in the world is separate from you. So for instance, a heavy bag, heavy bag is over there. I'm here. I hit the heavy bag. I'm hitting that heavy bag. It's over there. The heavy bag is not me. It's a target. And so if I'm engaged in a self-defense setting or something like this, it's like everything is targets. They're all separate from me. That's the essence of externality, separation. When you're engaging in the mode of internality, it's exactly the opposite. Everything is you. You are, I am one with the force, the force is with me. <laughs> um, Star Wars reference, I hope somebody out there laughed, but uh, there's no difference between you and the person that you're in a relationship with. 
And it just happens at this moment that that relationship is unbalanced and taking the form of some kind of violence. And your job in that interaction is to restore the balance. Your job isn't to, you know, be Judge Dredd and carry out the law or anything like that. It's to restore balance. And you restore that balance in the way that the person you're interacting with will allow. Among the immediate physical changes that uh, difference between internality and externality uh, bring to bear are in the internal practice, there's no such thing as distance, speed, time. All those things you know, that we think of, like in boxing, I gotta get my timing right, all this sort of stuff. No, that's all gone. Uh, that doesn't even exist. Hardly anybody practices in the mode of internality. There are a lot of people who, they think of internal and external, they go, oh, external is hard, internal is soft. I think that's the most common misconception I see. Uh, but you'll see a lot of people who are practicing Tai Chi, for example, which is supposed to be the standard bearer of internal practice, but they're practicing entirely in an external mode. So they're just, they're doing a form and their mindset is external and not internal. So what happens is that when you engage with somebody this way to both an onlooker and to the other participant in the relationship, it can seem like something magical happened. It'll be like, how did this happen? How, how, did, how did I get to the floor? I don't, I remember being up, now I'm down. How did, how did I get there? Um, and it's very, very difficult to learn this. It's very difficult, which is one of the reasons why I think uh, arts like Bagua uh, and even Tai Chi as an internal art have practically died out. There are so few people. Uh, one of my students goes periodically to China and his, I think it's part of his quest to try and find some Chinese person who's still doing this. I think the reason I was able to get some of this stuff is because the people who taught me were born, and I don't just mean Chen Mei Li because there were a couple of other California Chinese teachers that I had. They were born in the late 1800s and they were getting things uh, that allowed for different worldviews. Mm -hmm. uh, after the establishment of the People's Republic of China, alternate worldviews were not approved. And this led to things like religious persecution, uh, attempts to eliminate things that were considered old, anything that would conflict with sort of the, uh, the uh, prevailing political point of view. There's good and there's bad about that, but some things end up getting lost as a result. Uh, the Cultural Revolution. There was a reason why after the Cultural Revolution you found, uh, you know, and up into the 1980s and 90s, you could find masters who were either 40 years old or 80 years old. There was a whole generation that was gone. And it was because of things like the Cultural Revolution. And even the Chinese themselves now criticize what happened. They recognize that something important was lost. And it's very hard to get it back. So there you, there you go. Now, in, I just, I'll, I'll send out to my listening audience <laughs> my listening audience. You know, Today quick, they are, absolutely. No, 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 so quickly I claimed your podcast. But <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. You, 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 you outrank me in a variety of things. Why not? Why not? Anybody within the sound of my voice who thinks they can help me not be lonely. <laughs> and I'm happily married, so it's not that way. 
But if you're a martial artist and you would like to engage in in a in relationship, I am happy. I am here. I don't know how much longer I'll be here, but because I'm I'm getting to the end of the conveyor belt. But uh, how would they reach you? Uh, you know, Joe Esty, who is the uh, the Kaicho of Dotopa Shinkai at the moment, he's probably the best person to get hold of me through. And I think you can get hold of him through um, the Dotokushin website, which I think you're providing a link to. Yes. So, so that'd be all right. Also, there's a link to my Facebook page. I don't use Facebook really. Uh, <laughs> I have a Facebook page because I gave in to them. They all said, you have to have a Facebook page. You have to. Have. And so I have a Facebook page. Uh, all righty. That's a, that's a lot of talking. I just did a lot of talking. It was great. You know, yeah, I, good stuff. I generally don't like to talk about myself. In fact, if you search for me on the internet, I've gone to great lengths to try and keep myself invisible. Uh, what I, what I wanted was I wanted people who were meant to train with me to find me, but I didn't, you know, I, I started, oh, this is quite a while ago now. I reverted to an actual traditional method of teaching martial arts, which uh, is not the sort of U.S. military inspired mass teaching. It's much more of a mentoring, single person, small group mentoring along the path of martial arts. And, uh, and because I was never looking for commercial success, that, that, that was never going to be a component of my own martial journey, uh, I could afford the luxury of having people discover discover me and then finding out whether or not I was the right person to work with. Because sometimes people come to me, I talk with them. Uh, I'm a pretty exacting teacher. I think it's better to learn things correctly to start with rather than correct the mistakes later. Uh, one of the things I remember, oh, this must have been 1988. Somebody was learning Ishinru from me in uh, here in Massachusetts, and they were just a white belt. And I took them to the national headquarters of one of the Ishinru organizations with me for a visit because I, I knew the people and I was, I was related to them organizationally. And there was a class and my white belt was in the class. He told me that afterwards, when he was in the dressing room with the other green belts and brown belts and whatnot, they, they said to him, come on, what's, what's your actual rank? What's your actual rank? You're not a white belt. <laughs> because it's not typical to teach people in detail and make them, you know, ha have them perform the skills at a high level from the beginning. And, and I do that. So if somebody finds me, yay. And if, and if not, I usually try to discourage people from training with me. <laughs> the first time I talk to them, it's, I'm usually doing my best to convince them not to train with me. Uh, because if, if I can convince them not to train with me by talking to them so easily at the beginning, <laughs> you just know they're never going to, never going to go anywhere. Not to say that they, let me just, frame all this a little bit because I, I don't want to sound like I'm some kind of maniac. People practice martial arts for many, many different reasons. And almost every one of those reasons is a doggone good reason to practice. Some people practice because they want the, the social experience of being in class with others. And it can be a wonderful social experience. And you have, you have your, your comrades in in the arts and you all go out for pizza and you have fun and, and you practice together and you do things and that can be great. Some people practice, like look at me when I first started, I came from a position of incredible weakness. Some people pra start their practice from a 
position of fear. They're afraid and they want to get rid of that fear. And this might be a path to get rid of it. And that's wonderful. That's, that's also a good reason. Some people are really into the sport aspect, either uh, competition like uh, sparring, or they like the performance of kata as a performance. Wonderful. Some people get into it because they want to connect to the culture, the language. My father, when he first got me into uh, training, he said to me that it was okay if I would learn this fighting art. But I had to learn the culture behind it as well. And that was how he, you know, as a combat veteran, that's how he uh, sort of justified a little bit, letting his son learn to fight. Some people want to preserve that culture and the tradition, you know, the sort of, because there are arts that if you look at them, they're almost like a museum exhibit. And, and that's also glorious. Some people just want to do self-defense. All of these things are wonderful reasons to practice. I, you know, I've been asked, well, what, what would my life be like if I had never trained in martial arts? Thing is, I started as a teen. I have no idea what it'd be like, but I'm sure it would not be anything like it is now. And I've had, like, I would teach children sometimes, and father would bring me his his little boy and say the little boy was being beat up at school and so i would just take the boy aside and say okay what are they doing tell me what they're doing give me an example and the kid would say okay they they did this to me and so then i would say okay if they try to do this this is what you do and then we'd practice it a little bit together and i say did they do anything else yeah they, sometimes they try and do this okay when they try and do that, you do this. And then we would do it together a little bit, a little bit. I had one father who came, brought his son like that. He only came from one lesson. The father came back and told me the son had like changed his whole environment. <laughs> so these, these reasons are all wonderful reasons. And I don't want anybody ever to think that I don't think they're wonderful. Uh, the athleticism, the dedication, the work, the just plain joy that can go into the practice. It's just that not all of those are my path. That's all. I'm just in, on a different path. Well, not that my path is better. It's just a different path. <laughs> right. This has been a ton of fun. And, and you know, hang on the line. We'll, we'll talk for a few minutes more. But as we wind down the show, you know, the piece that we're going to share out with everyone. I ask all of the guests to leave us with some parting words, you know, wh however you want to think of that. Some people, you know, it's words of wisdom. Some people, it's just a, sometimes it's a thank you to the audience. You know, it can be a lot of different things. So if I ask you, you know, how do you want to end your episode here? What would you say to the audience? Thank you for listening. And I'm just going to say that when you're alive, be alive. I said on my tombstone, this is the motto that I want. When he was alive, he was alive. Be present for your own life. Don't sit back and let life just pass you by. You've just got this one and you need to participate in it. You need to live your life and be there for yourself, for other people. Somebody asked me recently at a dinner if there was one word that I would use to describe myself. And I had to think for a second, but I said, the word I would use is present. Be present. Be here. Be now. There's only this moment. Live in it. Enjoy it. Give it your all. And if you haven't read it, read Rudyard Kipling's poem, If. <laughs> Look it up. It's on the internet and give every minute of your life your full effort and you'll have a good life as you can probably tell i had a great time talking with grandmaster keenan wonderful stories so open 
Uh, and, you know, even as he described it, vulnerable at times. To borrow some words from what he said, we're all on a different path. But the fact that we are all on a martial arts path brings us together. It feels like we're all on roads headed in roughly the same direction, though some of ours are straighter, some have more hills, some are a little bit twistier. And there are pros and cons to every approach. I really did enjoy my time today, and I always love these stories. Here we are, 432 episodes in, and I'm still not bored. So thank you, sir, for coming on the show, for sharing, and I do hope that we find time to connect soon. If you want to learn more about Grandmaster Keenan's school, find a transcript, photos, head to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, episode 432, and you'll get everything you're looking for. Sign up for the newsletter while you're over there. We send out discounts and information, new products, even original content. There's stuff that goes in the newsletters that doesn't go up anywhere else. You can find us on social media. We're at Whistlekick, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And my personal email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.